It's that small. Despite the fact that the majority of consumers want to reduce their meat consumption, as you can imagine, the vast majority have absolutely no access to meat replacements. My name is Christy Legali. I'm the founder and CEO of Seattle Food Tech. At Seattle Food Tech, we make delicious, delicious, juicy, and affordable plant-based chicken nuggets and chicken patties for the food service market. We achieve this goal through the development of novel, plant, novel food production equipment, as well as automated production facilities that allow us to reach plant-based meat production scales not yet seen to date. Pardon me. Today you're going to learn about our work to address cost and scale of plant-based meat, as well as our work to address the infrastructure needed to truly grow the plant-based meat industry and provide high-quality plant-based meat at high capacity. I'm going to touch on three points. First, I want to talk about fundamentally the scale of the problem. How much plant-based meat are we talking about? How much do we actually expect to produce? And talk about, second, I want to talk about manufacturing technology and how it has made the meat industry so successful and as big as it is today. Finally, I want to share our strategy at Seattle Food Tech to produce plant-based meat at high volume and to compete not just on a product, product that we provide to the market, but also our capacity to produce it. So let's start with the scale of the problem. How many of you have tried to help a friend or help a neighbor reduce their meat consumption? Most of you. That's great. That's wonderful. And yet, how many have you heard that either it's cost too much to buy the alternative, or I just don't find it. I found it at the store once, and I never found it again. How many of you have had that experience? Yeah, most of us, because that is the reality. In the US, we produce over 105 billion pounds of animal meat, and that was just last year alone. It breaks our all-time human record for meat production, and it actually breaks the record from the year before that, and the year before that. We continue to see increased meat production about 3% year over year for the last three years, a little bit more than three years actually. By comparison, we produce between 100 and 200 million pounds of plant-based meat. That's million with an M versus 105 billion with a B. And as I mentioned earlier, that's about one-tenth of 1% of the plant-based, uh, pardon me, plant-based meat versus animal-based meat. Yet, as many of you probably know, the plant-based meat industry grows at about 6% year over year, which is absolutely amazing. It's fantastic. It's, it's really the work of many of the people at this conference that have made that happen. And it's probably going to be even more than that. It's a really, it's something to definitely be celebrated. But unfortunately, meat is also, animal-based meat is also growing, and it's expected to be at about 110 to 112 billion pounds of animal meat produced in the US every year within the next four years. And as a result, that 0.1% of plant-based versus animal-based meat will still be about 0.1% of plant-based versus animal-based meat. We're simply not keeping up with even the growth of one industry versus the other. And hence, 6% growth is just not enough. So I want to talk a little bit about how we even got here. How did we produce an industry that is able to produce so much meat? And essentially, the big question is, how is it possible to even process and kill, or kill and process, 60 billion farm animals worldwide every year? Well, there are a lot of reasons. First of all, there was a lot of innovation that's gone into animal feed and um, in transport of animals that has made it possible for us to differ, uh, essentially distribute the production of animals. But fundamentally, 
Part of the success goes into the mechanization of processing and killing animals. And it, this is what it really enables us to have so many animals, but also make them into a product. If that wasn't the case, all of us would have the same job. We would be processing and killing animals, because that's what it would take to process 60 billion animals. So imagine you walk into a slaughterhouse and animal processing facility. What you're going to see are large KUKA, they're called KUKA robots. They're large industrial robots that can essentially hold up, uh, hold and lift and move and position the carcasses of animals for processing. You'll see large robots that also have uh, saws on the end that are able to deconstruct those animals in a way that's efficient so that those pieces of meat can actually be brought down to the size where it's actually safe for a human to lift it. Otherwise, that wouldn't even be possible. They're just too big. The same thing would be true is if you walked into a chicken processing facility. You would see chickens hanging by shackles, moving through a kill and defeathering line, and then moving through a, an automated uh, production line where they're being deconstructed. Sometimes with the assistance of people, sometimes in a completely automated fashion. And given that in the United States, we're now producing over six, uh, pardon me, over 8.5 billion chickens every single year, again, if we didn't have manufacturing technology and mechanization, this would not be possible. We would all have one job. So hence the volume of meat we produce today, as I said, would not even be possible. But I want to talk a little bit more about the history of factory farming, as it really informs what we're doing today. Does anybody have a general idea of when factory farming first started? How old would you say factory farming is? OK, if you shout it out. 100 years. <laughs> 100 years. OK, that's a really good guess. Anybody else? Sorry? 40 years, and that's also a good guess because both are actually true. We really started industrializing animal agriculture about 100 years ago, a little bit more than before that, but fundamentally it was the start of the Industrial Revolution that was simply applied to the production of animals as well. But you're also correct that what we now know of as the factory farm and the modern chicken and animal-based processing facilities, animal processing facilities, really was developed at about 1950, really optimized in 1960, and frankly has been continued to be optimized to this day. In fact, it was a sought out solution. It was the, the, the ultimate solution, and it was highlighted in many newspaper articles and, and even just kind of future of the world type of cartoons that showed how wonderful it would be when we brought all the animals inside and concentrated them and then could process them through machines and how wonderful that would be. In fact, to date, few production systems are as sophisticated as animal processing facilities. Um, they really are only second or maybe even first to the production of cars. So the question starts to become, if we are truly to compete, if we're truly going to break out of that 0.1%, how, how are we going to catch up technologically? Well. The answer is somewhat simple. We need to make a lot more plant-based meat. And I wouldn't even say it's, it, that's too simplified way to say it. Um, it's really true. This isn't that hard of a problem. It was exactly what they did in the meat industry is we needed to make a lot more meat after World War II. Now we really need to make a lot more plant-based meat. And that's what we do at Seattle Food Tech. We design, build, operate smart, production facilities for the production of plant-based meat. Essentially, we're working to make it faster, better, and cheaper to make plant-based chicken nuggets and chicken patties, and we serve them to the food service market. So what this means is that we're actually designing novel pieces of equipment, novel ways of handling protein, novel ways of putting them together, novel ways of even texturizing where necessary, so that we can actually bring down the cost. Just like it was different to 
just kill a chicken out in the field or, or kill a cow out in the field to bring them into a slaughter facility and handle the animals in that way, we need to find, all, we need to find many new ways in order to poss or make plant-based meat. And that's exactly what we're doing. But we're also designing those pieces of equipment into automated production facilities that have a lower capital cost for the building itself because that also goes into the price of plant-based chicken products. And then we can replicate those facilities for a lower capital cost and lower startup costs as, and as well as lower location planning in general. Because all of that, as I said, goes into the cost of making plant-based meat. So the, our strategy not, is novel equipment and facility, and the outcome is a cheaper plant-based chicken nugget to the point where it is actually the same price as animal-based chicken nuggets. And that's what we do at Seattle Food Tech. And we also optimize our facilities in design so that we continue to replicate those facilities. Essentially, we standardize, automate, and replicate the production of plant-based meat. So we want, to really under, we want to really be the experts in understanding how to not just to compete on really great products. And by the way, I can't wait for all of you to try our juicy plant-based chicken nuggets because we've really found a fabulous way to make them so that they really can replicate not just the flavor and the texture, but also the juiciness of animal-based nuggets. But we want to further refine our strategy. And the way that we do that is really engaging with our community, engaging with the locations where we can set up facilities by taking advantage of things called oppor economic opportunity zones, where these are kind of, for lack of a better word, kind of depressed areas of the United States where the federal government has said it will be cheaper if you set up a facility in this location. Also, we can apply for environmental incentives to environmental incentive grants for new business that allow us to set up our facilities with the help of some public funds because they are a better option for communities. And we have to take advantage of things like regional job training programs that really help us to bring in the community to support a better alternative for producing protein. All of these uh, strategies really help us compete and provide a low cost product for plant-based meat that can truly compete on price and availability with animal-based meat. Because our facilities at Seattle Food Tech naturally offer safer jobs. They're better jobs. They offer cleaner facilities with very little waste. And most importantly for workers, they offer an opportunity to work in an environment that doesn't come with PTSD from handling and killing animals. And that's really important, and it's really important to the general public health of communities that we were going to work with. I want to tell you one really kind of uh, shocking story that I ran across during one of the um, reading one of the articles about a new chicken processing facility that was being set up in the Midwest. And the, the facility was sold as a potential facility for, obviously a facility to go into their town, a potential facility to go into their town. And the city council voted on it based on the fact that there was an opportunity to bring 200, 400, maybe in the future up to 1,000 jobs to their local community. But because it was a chicken processing facility that would genuinely provide food for the community and an op economic opportunity, they also had to raise taxes on the entire town by 5% in order to pay for a new, uh, uh, pardon me, a new wastewater processing facility to handle all the blood and feathers. We don't have to do that. We can see a world where plant-based meat production offers a genuine solution, not just for providing protein, but providing economic development for our communities. Hence, shifting from plant-based meat to, pardon me, shifting from animal-based meat to plant-based meat facilities is better for the environment, it's better for the community, and it's better for the workers. So, pardon me. Issue there. Let that one go. 
So we are really a community of innovators in the plant-based and cell-based world. We're really trying to solve a lot of issues, some very big issues. But we, can have, we have so much to learn from the meat industry. First, we obviously need to learn from scale. We learn, need to understand the strategies that made it possible to, essentially, to produce and kill 60 billion farm animals worldwide. We also need to develop engineered solutions for scale and make those a part of our product development. And finally, we need to be nimble and replicatable for growth so that we can truly make an impact in that number of 0.1% and really start to offer our friends, our communities with genuine alternatives to meet. Thank you. I would be more than happy to take your questions. I think I left plenty of time, maybe a little extra time. So if I can offer, ask any, uh, pardon me, if I can answer any question, I'd really love to hear them. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for the, the presentation. Thank that was, you. That was great. I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, do, do, is, it, is it true that production is the bottleneck or, or are there other kind of parts of the supply chain that are they're also the bottleneck. I mean, could you source enough yellow pea or cassava flour to, to be able to you know produce a billion or a hundred million uh, pounds of uh, plant-based meat today? Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm just going to repeat it for everybody to hear. Um, the question was: Is manufacturing truly the bottleneck for plant-based meat? Could we simply su uh, source more yellow pea to be able to then just produce as much as possible? Um, the answer is none of these things are, are, are in and of themselves the only bottleneck. Um, I, naturally, we work on manufacturing technology because we know we can make plant-based meat out of wheat and soy and those don't have a bottleneck. But if we are trying for a different kind of product, maybe a, a wheat-free product or a soy-free product, then naturally something like developing new proteins in the way of like increasing how much pea, yellow pea is available does become the bottleneck. Now, you know, there are also other bottlenecks. This is the one that we're working the hardest on. It's, you know, in so many ways, you have to focus to really make change in this industry. And I think most of you probably already know that. What we're focusing on is, is price and scale of one or two um, most consumed products. But it's a really great question because these are very complex systems, so it's not the only bottleneck. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Um, you talked about your focus being price and scale. How do you um, sort of pair that against the need for good taste and texture, which people want in their food? Yeah, so um, when I promised to come speak today, I told them that I would share our strategy on one side of the, one side of the aisle, I should say, <laughs> um, about our manufacturing technology. But um, the truth is that when, so just to, just to use our, us for an example, the development of new technologies for making plant-based meat or better technologies for making plant-based meat is driven by better products. So in our particular case, one of the things that we felt wasn't really, you know, kind of there there for plant-based chicken products was dryness. A lot of chicken products can be a little bit dry, especially when they're made it essentially at scale. And so we really felt like not only did we have to change the manufacturing to allow us to do it differently so that we can scale the product much more um, reasonably, but also we wanted to make it so it improved the product itself. And so at Seattle Food Tech, we, we offer a plant-based chicken nugget that we believe is the best on the market. <laughs> and it actually is um, probably the only plant-based chicken nugget I've ever tried that is actually juicy and releases juice just like an animal-based nugget is. So, um, so I realize I'm biased, <laughs> but it's a really good question because it's always driven by a really good product, but developing the capacity for that product has to be a part of the design of that product. And it doesn't mean we have to give up anything. Oftentimes we can improve the product by thinking outside the box and making it in a different way. Yeah, yes. Hi, how you doing? Uh, thanks good. for this. 
So my question, I, I'm interested in this focus on economic development. That's part Great. of your pitch here. And I'm curious, sort of, what, that, that's not something you necessarily hear a lot about at conferences like this. So yes. I'm curious, so sort of, could you take us through the genesis of thinking about that as a major part of what you're doing? Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, so the genesis. So this actually came at us at a number of different directions. First of all, it came at me particularly just because I was investigating what is it that made the meat industry so incredibly successful. But it also came as a genesis for the, the fact that we started in Seattle, Washington, which is obviously in Washington State. Well, I just said that, sorry. <laughs> obviously in Washington State. And in Washington State, they have a um, particularly active program around manufacturing support for small companies and large companies in order to utilize the, um, utilize the protein that is grown there. So first of all, you know, in seeing what the chicken industry has done, they go into places where there's a huge benefit to the community to add a chicken processing facility. There's a huge benefit to the surrounding communities to have a chicken growing facilities so that people can have jobs where they didn't have jobs or convert from their, the farming that wasn't working for them to chicken farming, which you know, may or may not work for them. So that was the genesis of thinking about that and realizing that 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 benefit was one of the reasons that chicken nuggets were $3.15 a pound and plant-based were much, much higher than that. So that's one of them. And then also Washington State has really, really good programs around teaching companies to, to um, support the community as well as through jobs development as well as um, you know, becoming a good company within the state. Did I answer your question? Okay, great. Yeah. About the Sorry. Of like pasture raising the animals before they go to the farm. I feel like that's kind of left out of this picture. Pasteurizing the chicken. Like, like grazing cattle or raising the chickens. Like a lot of times they're small farm owned before they send them off to the. So you're saying yeah. what about that solution as kind of a halfway yeah, point? Like, as animal farming decreases, like what incentivizes like the economic development of those uh, other people that are basically raising the animals before they go to the factory. Oh, I see. So I think what you're asking is what jobs can we offer to people who were raising animals on farms? Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, like before the animal goes to the factory farm, usually they're raised somewhere else. Yeah, so um, I think there's a, a couple of answers to that, and you know, I think that that's a question that's almost so personal to the individual farmer that it's it's almost different for everyone because farmers get into you know chicken raising for a variety of reasons. Either maybe they have done it for a long time, um, but also maybe they have um, maybe they have converted to other types of um, farming from and turned into chicken farming. There are a variety of options for that, you know, going back, looking at what opportunities they kind of didn't go after, like for example, if wheat wasn't growing on their land, maybe we go to peas or, you know, that's probably not a good example, but, you know, returning some of these farmers to maybe some of their previous crops might be an option. However, I think probably the best person to ask that is a group called Farm Transformers, and they're working on a really interesting and innovative project, project for helping farmers who were doing chicken, uh, chicken raising to find other sources of income to get out of that particular industry should they desire to do so. It's a good question, but I don't think I have a really good answer. <laughs> yeah. Is there, in the plant-based meat world, is there any single piece of equipment that you think is critical need of innovation and change? Um, well, there are pieces of equipment that are, are critical to really high quality plant-based chicken products and other types of products. It, obviously the extruder is one of them, um, but it's not the only one. There's a lot of processing equipment that's required to make plant-based meat of any kind. Um, the extruders are really sophisticated machines and they're very valuable to the plant-based meat industry, but it's just not the only one. We currently have prototypes, pardon me, we have early prototypes for actually three new pieces of equipment that we were working on and we feel like those are our next critical step. So I was told to wrap up so I'll take maybe one more question if that's okay and then. Okay.
quick question. You said you are optimizing your process, but for soy and gluten, basically. Yes. Do you think your process optimized for these two proteins will limit you to switch to a different source nope. in the future? Nope, it doesn't. In fact, it frees us from it. And that's one of the really be big benefits of what we're trying to do is that there are a lot of uh, equipment that are so optimized for just those two. We really felt like we needed more um, flexibility to avoid that particular problem so that we could be flexible and go to other proteins pretty easily. Great question. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Oh, that's